Hello, and welcome to the forbidding and fell-ravaged plains of Shadow Moon Valley. This zone holds a certain degree of nostalgia for me, as I loved the Netherwing dragons as soon as I saw them, and have done the tear-inducing rep grind multiple times to acquire them, back when you could only pick one colour and we didn't yet have a mount collection, but had to carry everything in our bags, good god what a nightmare of inventory management that was. And seeing that I started my Warcraft journey with Warcraft 3 and the Frozen Throne got me fixated on Maya of Shadowsong as my first favourite video game character, Shadowmoon Valley held my interest more so than the other zones of Outland. It's just a shame that Maya barely makes an appearance in the zone and then gets done absolutely dirty at the end of the raid for no conceivable reason. Holy Jesus! What is that? What the fuck is that? Before we get started, you should know that this part of the series has been split into multiple videos because there were simply too many things going on at once and I needed breathing room. With that being said, it is here we finally bring to bear all our might against the Lord of Outland and discover what lies beyond the gates of Shadowmoon Valley. Let's get started. Upon the completion of our mission in Netherstorm, we receive a communication from Khadgar to return to Shatrath at once. We have a way in to Serpent Shrine Cavern. Upon our return, Khadgar informs us that Shatari agents have been working with our allies in Zangamarsh, and in particular, working with the Naga traitor Skarthis. This was mentioned in the Zangamarsh video, but in canon, Skarthis is a caged up Neptulon worshipper who was part of the Attunement questline for Serpent Shrine Cavern and so he serves the same function here since we first met him back in Zangermarsh. The only difference is that we don't actually do the attunement because things do in fact happen in this world that don't directly involve the player character, and it makes sense to me that other people would be investigating avenues of attack. Moving on. Khadgar explains that after several perilous missions, the Shatari agents were able to assemble a powerful staff known as the Spine of Neptulon, which will bypass the intricate magical lock with which Vash sealed the cavern. This is the last serious holdout of Illidan's influence outside Shadowmoon Valley. Once it's gone, they'll be able to act on intelligence gathered by Warden Amberlance. For now, Khadgar urges us to focus on Vash and sends the adventurer through a portal directly to the entrance. Our allies have gathered in wait, and forces stand in defensive positions around the reservoir pool to protect the rear, making sure the way out stays open to us. We can talk to a few people for extra lore here, notably Scarthus, who tells us about the Spine of Neptulon, a Shatar commander NBC who explains more about the mission to get us here, and Amberlance. The Warden refuses to elaborate on what's next so as not to jeopardize their intel should things go wrong here, but she does provide insight on Vash during the War of the Ancients, which tacitly reveals that Amberlance was born pre-Sundering. When we're ready, we talk to Tyrion, and our team enters the story mode of Serpent Shrine Cavern. Entering the cavern, our team consists of Scarthus, Tyrion, Amberlance, Varok, Verisa, Laurelen, Ural, Liadrin, Samara, Chieftain Mumaki of the Daggerfen, and Aranak Stonespeaker. Aranak is a broken shaman some of you may remember being introduced to us in Cataclysm if you did the Vashir story. In this version of things, Aranak is simply introduced to us sooner, having lived among the Kurunai in Zangamarsh, and joins the assault on Serpent Shrine as a champion of his people. Entering the cavern, Scarthus would guide us from each encounter to the next, slowly working our way towards Vash's inner sanctum. For the first encounter, Hydros the Unstable, Scarthus tells us that the Naga embedded an anchor in the Elemental's core, forcing him to act as a filter for the water flowing through the reservoir. The Naga are sensitive to magic, but so too are they sensitive to pollutants in the water. It's why their holdings in Shadowmoon are almost non-existent save the aqueducts of Karabor. They have more such Elementals bound there. An affront to the Lords, even far away on this alien world. This sacrilege cannot be permitted to continue. 
We fight to weaken the powerful water elemental until Scarthus can use the spine of Neptulon to purify it completely and free it from Naga control. When this is done, Hydrus thanks us and pledges to hold Vash's pet kraken below the water where it cannot reach us. Verisa is alarmed at the mention of a kraken, and Scarthus elaborates, <sighs> Most know it as the lurker below. Its actual name is Kalrok Nightmare. The last thing anyone sees when it strikes is a gaping mouth as black as night rushing up to swallow them. It would be best for us to avoid spending our energy killing it. Scarthus then points us to the northernmost chambers, where Varsha's second in command, Fathom Lord Carathras, holds the key to her lair. He is coordinating the forces inside while she is directing the retreat to Black Temple. Fighting through Varsha's followers in the main chamber, we're aided by tendrils of water as Hydrus pulls enemies into the reservoir below, where a crunch in a pool of blood implies a gruesome death either by the elemental or a very undiscerning and hungry Kalarok. Now, in this version, Morogrim Tidewalker, the sea giant working with Vash, is still killed. However, Scarthus notes that the Murlocs who serve Vash do not get a choice in the matter, like so many denizens of Azeroth's great oceans when Ajara's empire finds them. Vash may not be loyal to the queen anymore, but she is still Naga. You may think them no smarter than any simple fish you catch for dinner, but they are creatures of culture, language, faith, and they do not enjoy having their liberty ripped from them. Scarthus gives us a coral wand to nullify the shackles keeping the murlocs in line, and once we're done, we confront Morogrim. Only here, similar to the Houndmaster fight in Scarlet Halls, when he calls on his servants, the murlocs pounce upon him like an abused circus animal might upon its handler. Morogrim swats, stomps, and struggles, but fueled by frenzied hate, the murlocs bring him down with poisoned spears, gnashing teeth, and ragged claws. We leave them to butcher the sea giant's corpse and move on to Fathom Lord Carathress, who puts up a valiant defense alongside his guards but ultimately falls as well, letting out one final cry of apology for failing Lady Vash. Taking his key, we head to- what's that? There's another boss in this raid, you say? Well, Leotherus the Blind isn't fought here, or at all. In fact, he's already dead because it seems contradictory for Illidan to just let a failed demon hunter roam free, let alone consciously exile him to Zangamarsh, where he could, and did, cause all manner of havoc against his allies, the Naga. It would have made far more sense to just execute Leotherus, because a failed demon hunter might as well be a servant of the Burning Legion, and that's what all this strife is supposedly about. Right, Illidan? Fighting the Legion? Anyway, we don't fight him. Opening the way to Vash's lair, we storm in to confront the Naga leader, who greets us with lightning and arrows, giving no space for a chance at surrender. Vash is a difficult fight as she utilizes her magic and mobility, diving in and out of the isolated water of her chambers, summoning ice and water elementals, and creating storms of lightning, all the while harrying the group with arcane arrows. Throughout the fight, she rages against us as fools who will die for short-sighted principles rather than do what it takes to survive. She was there when the Legion first invaded Azeroth, and she was too caught up in Ajara's presence to care about anything but pleasing her queen, even if that meant bringing ruin to the world she called home. Honor, compassion, and diplomacy are worthless to the dead, and we are only hastening our destruction by fighting the one man who knows what needs to be done. Amberlance, however, doesn't let this go unchallenged, and when Vash is brought to low health, she begins pointing out all the ways Illidan has failed in his mission. He lost control of Hellfire to Doom Lord Kazak. There was a rebellion in the ranks of his enslaved laborers, leading to thousands escaping and turning on him. The Scryers betrayed him as soon as they arrived at the city they were ordered to conquer, and even one of their supposed triumvirate, Prince Kael'thas, turned his back on them when Illidan refused to do what he promised because he arrogantly, violently, cannot accept that he does not know 
better than everyone else. And Vash is following him just as blindly as she followed Ajara, as if that will wipe her hands clean of the horrors brought on by the War of the Ancients. Enraged, Vash unleashes a deafening crash of lightning, triggering a cutscene. We see Vash injured, breathing heavily as sparks skitter along her smoking arms. Our allies stand arrayed against her, worse for wear, but very much standing firm with their weapons at the ready. Amberlance steps forward and lifts her glaive, telling Vash that she is done. She can either die here, or surrender and help them stop him before more lives are ruined. A tense beat passes between them, before Vash scowls and hisses, blood trailing down her chin. Amberlance narrows her eyes and silently lifts her glaive to deliver a killing blow. Demons burst from the water, immediately putting our group on the defensive and distracting everyone except Amberlance, who jumps back just in time to avoid attack as another figure emerges from the water. Illidan lands with a crash of Fellfire, sending the Warden further back until she's forced to engage with the demons attacking everyone else. Vash appears both surprised and relieved at Illidan's arrival, and to her unspoken question he answers, I said I would come for you. We must leave. Rings of Felrune surround Illidan's hands as he reaches out and tears open a portal to some dimly lit chamber, slinging two of Vash's arms over his shoulder to help her through. Growling out a frustrated no, Amberlance slips between the attacking demons and swings her glaive, sinking one of the blades into Illidan's lower back. His wings snap out and send Amberlance flying, taking the blade with her as glowing green blood splatters the ground. She only looks up in time to see the portal closing. On the other side, Vash tries to ask after Illidan's health, warning him that the Azerothians have too much momentum. With laboured breathing, Illidan tells her that he knows, and that he needs her to listen to him very carefully. Despite Vash's escape, Tyrion sees the operation as a success, and Amberlance agrees. The Naga presence in Zangamash has been thoroughly broken, and they will doubtless continue to cause harm, but nowhere near the level of contesting an entire region again. We're sent back to Shatrath, where Khadgar has us help him prepare for a war council, talking to Voranthal of the Scryers, High Priestess Ishana of the Aldor, Sky Commanders Adaris and Keller of the Shatari Skyguard, and the Circle of Lower City representatives. It's made clear that while there are lingering resentments between the Aldor and the Scryers in particular, their leadership understands how critical their cooperation is moving forward. We would also see this in the form of NPC chatter on our way to the High Priestess, with a particularly old Draenei sympathising with the tragic circumstances of the Blood Elves to a much younger, less forgiving Vindicator from the Exodar. Are we to just forget about their crimes? They are nothing more than snakes shedding their skin when it suits their purpose. Their people suffered a horrific slaughter just as we did. They believed their leaders were on the path to prosperity and safety. Survival was all that mattered. And that justifies every cruelty? Every life taken? No. You were a child when they sealed Tempest Keep, were you not? I was. We are but a fraction of our people. The majority remained on Argus to become the right hand of Sargeras. Do you believe we rejected his offer because of our inherent goodness? What other reason could there be? Survival. We fled because we knew the Dark Titan posed a threat to our way of life. And as small a minority as we were compared to the rest of Argus, we could not fight it. What does this have to do with the elves? You were safe within Tempest Keep while those of us unfortunate enough to be stuck outside did what was necessary to survive. We followed our leaders and their orders because we believed that anyone who wasn't us only wanted our extinction. It was a period of 
blood and cruelty and terror until we found ourselves again. So too must the elves find who they are without the terror of genocide hounding their every step. As for the lower city, we'd see a bunch of familiar faces from around the other zones, such as Rexar, Ikram, Galfrit, Laka, Umran, Garrosh, Jorin, and others. Least expected among them would probably be Anzu, the Arakoan wild god, and Baron Sablemane, who has come to offer the aid of the Netherwing and Bloodmull ogres. Returning to Khadgar, we'd find our more immediate allies already gathered, with some important additions. Samara stands with Yrel and Leadrin, and Sarfang is present alongside his son and niece. Talking to both would reveal how they're feeling, with Sarfang carrying a great deal of shame and guilt, and Samara a mix of sorrow, anger, and survivor guilt. While neither Dranosh or Thora try to absolve Sorfang of his role in attacking Shatrath, Dranosh in particular tries to soften the blow by reminding his father that he never would have taken part if not for the demon blood. At this point, it's been made crystal clear that without fell corruption, orcs are not bloodthirsty butchers by nature. And while, yes, skirmishes broke out before the corruption took place thanks to Gul'dan's political machinations, it wasn't until Manoroth's blood coursed through their veins that the truly senseless attacks and kidnapping began. I'd stress this because Warlords of Draenor, while it had a lot of good bits mixed in, just completely undercut the idea that orcs were only warmongering butchers because of the demon corruption, and instead made it out that they're just naturally like that. Because summarizing a panel talking about the evolution of Thrall throughout Warcraft history, what made Garrosh a monstrous fascist was him trying to be the orkiest orc who ever orked, and the key thing that seemingly makes Thrall good and not like Garrosh is him being raised by humans. You know, as a slave. Which, considering the visual and narrative coding that goes into orcs is a bit yikes, I would say. Sarfang reluctantly accepts this, but remarks that even if it was involuntary to some degree, his body still did the killing, and his mind, clouded though it was by demonic bloodlust, still reveled in the slaughter. He can still remember it clearly, and it's difficult to forget that version of yourself, like a wild animal wearing your skin, now consigned to the darkest corners of your mind, pacing in its cage, waiting. Sometimes it feels as if that animal is just below the surface, like a ball of burning pitch in his chest, anger, sorrow, shame, guilt, all boiling down into pure pain. Desperate for release. I was not myself, but I must live with the misery my hands wrought without me. On the other side of the gathered crowd, we can talk to Yurel and Samara, who is described as standing stiffly, with a clenched jaw, furrowed brow, and a tight grip on the pommel of the crystal mace hanging on her hip. Asking how she's faring will prompt Samara to share that it's hard to stay in the present and not sink back into memories of blood-soaked streets and choking fog. We'd learn that the Draenei refer to the Siege of Shatrath as the Night of the Red Mist, and that towards the end there was so much blood covering the ground that weapons skittered senselessly and people slipped easily. The only way to escape without slipping and getting caught by those looking for survivors was to crawl through the blood and bodies until your hooves could safely touch the ground. Samara goes on to comment, There were others like me, other survivors, trying to escape, but they tried to stand and run. They would slip and fall and make too much noise. Try again, only to be spotted by the butchers. I would lie still until it was quiet, and then I would move over and over until I reached the old docks and slipped into the sea. I'm still unclear 
how many others escaped that night. Yrel is supportive and helps ground her sister by holding her hand and urging Samara to focus on the sound of her voice, the sound of the Nara nearby, the smell of incense burning, the pressure of her hand, to which Samara takes a deep breath and thanks Yrel for keeping her present. Talking to Adal, the War Council begins with Amberlant sharing what she's discovered, a hidden passage into Shadowmoon Valley. Through her investigations in the Lower City, she was able to gain the trust of key figures among the Kurunai here, and learned of a secret tunnel connected to a prison complex built against the mountains that wall Shadowmoon off. Many Broken have escaped through it before, and they were understandably reluctant to compromise its existence for a counter-strike against Illidan. Now that the supposed Lord of Outland's grip on the realm has weakened considerably, they're willing to risk it. The plan is to send a team through the tunnel, infiltrate the valley, and sow enough disruption that they can bring down the gate and allow the rest of their forces to march into Shadowmoon. An aerial assault is out of the question, as the Tuskbreaker Mountains are littered with demonic artillery and patrolled by squads of Dragonmoor raiders. The airspace is simply too dangerous. Teleportation is also a non-starter, there's too much interference from defensive pylons. Whilst Illidan's forces can teleport safely, if anyone not attuned tries it, the pylons will scramble the spell and spit them out the other side as a fine red mist at best and a mangled, mutated pile of agonized flesh at worst. Verisa expresses shock at this, as Quel'Thalas had similar defensive pylons powered by Arcane that simply blocked all attempts by those unattuned. Lorlan adds that Arthas was only able to bypass much of Silvermoon's outer defenses thanks to a traitor in the ranks, telling him where to find the waygates scattered across their land in secret locations. She doubts Illidan has such a flaw to exploit. Amberlance confirms that Illidan does not, and answers Verisa by saying that the violence of the pylons is a direct result of the fell magic powering them. With no other options beside the tunnel, our original group gears up again to journey into Shadowmoon Valley while the rest of Outland's free people prepare for an invasion. Before we leave, Khadgar hands everyone in the group a protective bracelet made of crystal beads. He explains that of all the regions in Outland, Shadowmoon Valley is the most saturated with fell. It will be like walking into a cloud of poison. The more we breathe in, the more that poison builds in our bodies until it becomes acute. These were created by Adal and his kin. They will protect you from the radiant energy of the valley for a time. When the crystal reaches its capacity to contain the fell, it will blacken and crumble, banishing that energy to the nether. While you open the way to Shadowmoon, the Naru will manufacture more for our troops. Khadgar wishes us luck, and we're pointed to a crevice in the Tuskbreaker Mountains. Amberlance leads the way through a winding passage, dimly lit by blue crystals that jut from the walls like knives, until we arrive at the most grueling part of that journey, a long, narrow tunnel that requires a belly crawl to get through. But Morgan, I hear you say, the player character could be anywhere between a gnome or a tauren. How will the bigger races fit into such a cramped space? Well... Broken are bigger than humans, and the devs never really seem to think about how on earth any race bigger than the one human male they scale everything off of fits into costumes, disguises, or vehicles, so shush. We emerge on the other side into a decrepit cellar, where the muffled sounds of a riot echo down from above. The team moves quickly to exit the cellar, revealing the true extent of the chaos as Shattered Hand fell orcs loyal to Illidan fight with pale ones and dwarves. Neither are quite what we expect, however. These pale orcs stand up straight and haven't lost as much muscle mass or body fat as the ones we fought in Nagrand. They're still skinnier than a normal orc, with a ghostly pallor and eyes like dead stars, but they are far removed from the animalistic wretches who prey on travelers in the dead of night. 
The dwarves clearly fell afoul of the demonic energies that saturate the valley. Bristling obsidian growths cover their skin like scales, thicker at the shoulders and back. Their eyes glow with fell. Their skin comes in different stony hues, and both hands and feet have grown thick claws capable of burrowing through rock or disemboweling an enemy. The shattered hand in this courtyard fall quickly, and the assembled orcs and dwarves turn to our group with suspicion. One of the dwarves, Kurdran Wildhammer, demands to know if we're friend or foe. Amberlance clarifies that our team has arrived under orders from the Shatar. They are moving against Illidan's claim over Outland and bringing the fight to him. Kurdran grunts his acceptance and notes that formal introductions can wait until they're somewhere safe. Right now, he asks the team to help free Valra Blackspear, another rebellious demon hunter who turned on Illidan. Tyrion is surprised to hear that it's happened more than once, prompting Kurdran to explain that two of his rogue hunters are helping them with this prison break. He urges us to move after pointing us in the right direction, and tells us to regroup in the main courtyard when we hear a wolf howl. Sarfang asks what happens if they don't hear it over the noise of this battle, and Kurdran only says that we'll hear it, before diving into the ground with the rest of the dwarves. The Pale Orcs rush off to a different section of the prison, leaving us to track down Blackspear. Fighting through a couple of corridors, we see other cells containing Broken, Blood Elves, Naga, and Orcs, all in various stages of health, with a few lying dead in a pool of their own blood, and one with a chained-up skeleton. Laurelin takes the keys off a dead officer and opens the cells as we go, giving us a few insights through the prisoners' dialogue when they flee. The prison appears to be a place of malice and spite more than anything else. Most of them were either loyal servants of Illidan, or in the case of a few broken, rebellious slaves. Those previously loyal were imprisoned for failures, sedition, or even speaking out against excessive cruelties like those enacted on the Broken or Netherwing. Reaching Valra's cell, we find her kneeling with chains connected to her arms and neck, forcing her close to the ground. When interacting with her, she's described as being covered in sweat, blood, and lash marks, both old and new. She recognizes a broken player character, offering them a weak smile through the blood and grime, and telling them she's glad to see them healthy and hale. After freeing her from the chains, Valra tells us where we can find Maiev Shadowsong, Illidan's former jailer. This immediately grabs the attention of Amberlance, who insists that we must get to Maiev before the retreat is sounded. Hurrying out, we emerge into the main courtyard, where we can see two demon hunters, Altruist the Sufferer and Salrassi Bloodmoon, fighting in the air with a dreadlord called Nalthrazar, who has the title Overseer of Shattersoul Prison. Passing into another section, we fight into the lower levels of what appears to be the maximum security wing, where demons guard the way instead of the shattered hand. Reaching my cell, we find her kneeling, chained, covered in lashes, sweat, and blood, but it's clear she's in a worse state than Valra once Amberlance starts to free her. Calling Yurel over to help hold the Warden upright, Amberlance is described as taking Maiev's shaved head in hand and inspecting her eyes. Amberlance notes that Maiev's pupils are extremely dilated, which prompts Sarfang to ask how she can tell when Night Elves look like they don't have pupils. Amberlance offhandedly comments that they do, they're just difficult to see through the glow. She goes on to say that Maiev feels very warm to the touch, and after taking her pulse, Amberlance mutters that her heart is beating faster than it should be. Maiev also seems almost completely unaware of our presence, muttering to herself that she's going to kill that mongrel, and pleading for a loon to give her the strength to do so. Sarfang comments that Maiev's state reminds him of moonleaf intoxication. It's a plant native to Kazangar that causes delirium and a host of other symptoms when taken. Illidan may have been feeding her hallucinogens to keep her too out of it to execute an escape plan. Infuriated, Amberlance inspects Maiev again and finds that she's missing teeth. This disturbs Tyrion and Sarfang, but outright horrifies Liadrin, Verisa, and Laurelin to varying degrees. Yurel is confused for only a moment before she realizes in real time exactly why the elves of the group are harder struck by that detail. She asks if elven teeth keep growing back like the Draenei's do, and Amberlance stiffly confirms this. Now, horrifying as the context you're learning this in is, it comes from a thought I had about how long elves live and how much it would suck if they only had two sets of teeth like humans do. 
Since elves descended from trolls, and trolls have incredible regenerative abilities, the idea is that as they evolved into the longer-lived elves, they may have lost the ability to regrow limbs like trolls can, but they retain enough regeneration to replace the teeth they lose over time. This means that whenever a tooth is damaged or rotting, it will naturally loosen and fall out to prepare the space for a new one. This process is uncomfortable and sometimes painful as the new tooth settles in, and leads to a variety of behaviours such as collecting all lost teeth, only collecting the fangs, and presenting a healthy extracted fang to the object of one's affections. And as per Yrel's dialogue, I figured a Draenei must have something going on with their teeth, because most of them are anywhere between hundreds to tens of thousands of years old, and still have perfectly functioning teeth, so either they have the best dental care in the galaxy, or broken and rotting teeth just get naturally replaced by newly grown ones. Moving on. A ghostly wolf howl echoes through the prison, signalling the retreat. With Sarfang carrying Maev, we rush back to the main courtyard where Nalthrazar lies dead. Across the way, Kurdran waits with all the other dwarves, Paolox, Valra, and other prisoners waving us over. In a crash of fellfire, Illidan lands in front of the group, snarling that that accursed woman was exactly where she belonged. He hisses that we aren't going anywhere, only for Altruis and Salrassi to descend, striking him in the back. Illidan is knocked to his hands and knees, allowing the rogue demon hunters to hold him down with spellcraft. Salrassi yells to the group that this will not hold him, and to run. We cross the courtyard to a void portal torn open by the Pale Orcs, all the while Illidan bellows that he will hunt us down and hang us from the spires of Black Temple by our guts. The demon hunters urge us to hurry, and with no other option, we step through the void. spits us out into the gloaming depths of the Shadow Moon burial grounds, sheltered deep beneath the surface of the valley. Our team is greeted by star speaker Shalka Hollowheart, spiritual leader of what remains of the Shadow Moon clan. She dresses in ragged, dark purple robes and nothing more, carrying only a tall, gnarled wooden staff. She congratulates Kurdran and his orcish counterpart, Gromtor, on their successful raid of Shattersol Prison, before addressing the group. And I see we have guests. Newcomers to what remains of our bleak lands. I will not ask for your aid just yet. You are clearly exhausted, and your friend there needs our help more at this very moment in time. Sarfang steps forward, suspicious of these orcs who bear more than a passing resemblance to Rook Naku. Wait, what are you? We aren't the animals you faced. We are those who went into hiding when Nazul began to fail us. Embracing the darkness between stars was not a want, but a necessity to protect ourselves from becoming like the demon-blooded. We would not have even known it as an option without the Night Hunter, Nogorla. Shalka reminds him that the wolven wild god of Kazimgar, while widely revered by hunters, shaman, and warrior alike for his wisdom and companionship, isn't solely a creature of the moon when bright and full. Oh, have you forgotten his true nature? Sarfang answers quietly that Nogorla is split down the middle, one half black, the other half white. His shadow, the darkness of a moonless night with nothing but the stars for guidance, that is the side of him revered most by the Shadow Moon, and it is in that darkness that Nogorla gave them shelter. Accepting that Shalka and her clan are not a threat to them, our group disperses, leaving the player to explore, talk, and learn. The Shadowmoon clan and the Wildhammer dwarves have joined into a single faction known as the Shadowhammer, 
and came about when members of the Shadow Moon helped the dwarves regain sanity and control of themselves after becoming nearly mindless with fell saturation. We can find Maev and Amberlance in a secluded chamber where people are being treated for sickness and injury. Amberlance is without her hood for once, showing us that she has dark green hair tied into a single braid and no facial tattoos. Shalka is present and performs a ritual to draw out the poison from Maiev's body, causing the drug-addled warden to struggle and snarl in Darnassian, which Night Elf players can understand as Maiev thinking she's being attacked and cursing everyone around her. Amberlance holds her down until the ritual is over, and Maiev goes limp from exhaustion. Shalka moves quickly to make her drink a foul-tasting concoction that nonetheless brings her back to lucidity. The first clear word out of her is a name, spoken with obvious confusion. Naisha? Huntress Naisha Amberlance confirms that it is indeed her, and Maiev wearily remarks that this doesn't look like the Sea of Stars, where dead night elf heroes are taken by the night warrior aspect of a loon. Naisha responds that they aren't dead, not yet and urges Maiev to get some rest. The Warden has been through a lot. Too drained to argue, Maiev passes out. Naisha thanks Shalka for her aid and promises that when they are fighting fit, they will do everything they can to bring Illidan down. The Star Speaker appreciates this and leaves us to help others in need of healing. Talking to Naisha, the player can ask what that was about, and Naisha explains that she should be dead. Prompting her for more triggers a cutscene. With Naisha's voice narrating, we see the aftermath of Tyrande breaking Illidan out of his prison. The halls of the Barrow are blood slick and littered with fallen watchers, but Maiev rallied those who were left, and they set out to recapture Illidan before he could do more harm. Our view switches to the massacred city of Nendis, blazing against the night sky, Illidan's hoofprints burned into the earth. He called up the Naga and slaughtered the innocents living there simply because they were in his way. We see the Watchers chasing him across the sea to Kindanor, the Broken Isles. At first, they thought he meant to lay siege to the Vault of the Wardens, a prison designed to keep powerful demons from the War of the Ancients contained, rather than allowing them to resurrect in the Twisting Nether by killing them. But no, he was after something else, and they pursued him into the accursed depths of the Tomb of Sargeras, where he sought the Eye of Sargeras. They failed to stop him in time, and Illidan used the Eye to bring the tomb crashing down upon them. The narration stops, switching to a scene of the trapped watchers trying to shift rubble that is too heavy to move. All the while, seawater steadily fills the room, and the distant sounds of demons clashing with Naga gets more and more distant. Naisha tells Maiev to leave them behind. Blessed by the Night Warrior as she is, she can travel through the shadows and escape. She can continue the mission and stop him. Maiev looks at Naisha sharply, wide-eyed under her helmet. Don't. You have to. You must warn our people of what that mongrel did here. Do not ask this of me. I have given my life to our purpose. I cannot sacrifice you. Tears slip down Naisha's face, and she leans close, pressing a kiss to the brow of Maiev's helmet, causing the Warden's eyes to narrow and fill with tears of her own. Please, don't make me watch you die. I swear to you, we will reunite in the Sea of Stars. Reluctantly, with the water now up to their thighs, Maiev mutters a promise to make Illidan pay before blinking from the chamber in a swirl of starry darkness, and it fades to black. The cutscene ends, and we return to Naisha, who explains to us that with all the fighting going on throughout the tomb, just as the Watchers took their last breath, one of the larger rocks blocking their way was blasted loose. Of course, they tried to swim, but the water was hard to see through and full of danger. At times, there was more blood in the water than silt, and as far as Naisha knows, she was the only one who made it. 
She was too injured to regroup with the remaining watchers outside and got picked up by some goblin sailors in the area who moved on from the aisles before she was lucid enough to protest. They had her repay their medical care with guard work, and by the time she was free of it, Maiev was gone, and there was no other way to Outland that Naisha knew of. Now that they have a foothold in Shadowmoon Valley, and she's found Maiev alive, Naisha intends to make contact with the Vault Wardens, who will be able to help them bring Illidan down for good. And with that, we are done with the first part of our journey into Shadowmoon Valley. The next one will handle the meat of the zone, and the third will deal with the Black Temple story mode and the aftermath. Special shoutouts to my patrons, who are all very handsome people, and if you would like to support this kind of content, you can follow the link in the description. I would also like to thank my newest patron, Dragovian Knight. Thank you for watching, make sure to drink your water, take your medication, treat yourselves kindly, and I will see you next time as our campaign against the Lord of Outland shifts into high gear. 